Good afternoon, committee, um, state employees and teachers and Vermonters who are watching on YouTube. Uh, before we start to take testimony today, I thought it would be good to review um, a little bit of the work ahead of us and why we're undertaking the difficult task of stabilizing our public pension system. Um, all of us in the committee and, and throughout the legislature have been receiving emails from teachers and state employees concerned about this discussion and, uh, and you know, asking questions about some of the ideas that have been presented so far. I want to emphasize that this is the starting point of our conversation about how to stabilize the pension system, and we are eagerly awaiting uh, your input in this process. Uh, a few things first that I think um, we can agree upon. Um, our public pension systems are not in a good financial position right now. Uh, the reason we're here is because we continue to see a decline in the funding level and a, a rise in the unfunded liabilities. And the ADEC, or essentially the mortgage payment that we need to pay each year, has grown by $96 million just since last year. Uh, historical actions, some of which occurred before uh, any of us were elected, have greatly contributed to the situation that we're in. And like a majority of state and municipal pension systems, the Great Recession of 2008 um, really had a, a major impact. Uh, stabilizing the public pension system is a, is a very challenging uh, conversation, but without action, I worry that we're jeopardizing the security for current retirees, as well as the promise of a retirement system for folks who are in our workforce right now. Uh, the opportunity that we have right now is that we were able to identify $150 million in one-time money to put towards the different pension buckets. Um, we're gonna do the analysis, do the hard work, um, talk with your union representatives um, and other folks who are coming before the GovOps committee uh, to see where investing this money will give us uh, our greatest return. Um, this is a tremendous opportunity and we certainly don't wanna squander that on behalf of our public employees and your pension system. Uh, there's a lot more that I could say here, but uh, we will be deliberating on this uh, in, in committee testimony over the coming weeks. Um, we have added a second public hearing next week. I understand that it is already um, at capacity, and so I would welcome folks to, uh, to write to us, uh, email the committee. Uh, if you want to share your remarks from tonight, um, uh, I'll ask somebody on staff to put that in the chat so that you can get referred refreshed on the email address to send your remarks to. Um, but we want to engage with you and, uh, and hear your thoughts as we look at how to um, solidify the future of our retirement system. Uh, everyone has had a really difficult year um, and our teachers and our public employees are um, among the most critical people uh, who've helped us get through this pandemic so far. And I don't take lightly that this is a very difficult time to be entering into this conversation with you. Um, it is challenging for, for me personally as well. Uh, but I believe we have a, an important moment ahead of us. We have an opportunity um, and I'm just inviting folks to make uh, a good faith effort to join into this conversation with us. Um, a few logistics. Uh, this is a webinar format on Zoom. Uh, so right now the committee and a handful of staff members are panelists and you are all attendees. Um, I will call up the next speaker and name the person who is on deck. Um, pardon the baseball softball reference, but uh, it just seems easy that way. Uh, when it's your turn, you'll be brought into the panelist room. And when you're brought in, you will be muted. So please just keep an eye on where your unmute button is. It's different depending on what device you're in. Um, and uh, we will start the timer once you are in and have unmuted and started your remarks. Uh, if you aren't able to get through all your thoughts, like I said before, please send them to the email address um, where we're collecting written testimony. You will see a countdown clock in one of the Zoom squares and Representative Gannon has another signal that he's going to show when, uh, when someone's time is up because I know, that, um, I know that sometimes it's hard to watch the countdown clock as, you, uh, as you're reading from your prepared remarks. 
Um, and once you've reached that two minute mark, um, we'll ask you to sum up your thoughts um, and you'll be moved back into the attendees list and um, you're welcome to either listen from there or to jump over to the YouTube uh, stream if you wanna watch the remainder of the hearing from YouTube. And um, without any more um, introductory remarks, um, I'm gonna say, I, I'll call up the first two folks. We've got Karen Shea Denniston up first and then Peter Booth is on deck. Welcome, Karen. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. I'll speak in bullets to be concise. One, you reduced time for comments from three minutes to two minutes, claiming to want to hear from more people, and that's suspect. If the speaker wanted to hear from more people, more time would be added. It has happened before. One example, the 2014 Joint Legislative Committee on Child Protection. They traveled the state and listened to people all summer and fall to create a plan. If it matters, you make it happen. Two, the governance structure proposal does nothing to address the primary root cause of the underfunding for years by the prior legislatures and administrations. There's nothing compelling proper funding levels in the future. Three, the plan design places the entire burden of the underfunding on the shoulders of employees. You are misleading Vermonters to suggest that using $150 million in one-time funding is generous, given the amount of federal funding that is coming to our state and the price of new programs you're currently creating. Four, I have no time to detail the impacts of the individual parts of this disastrous plan. However, I will share that I am one employee who started working at the age of 25. Your plan would have me work an additional 11 years and cost me over $600,000 in lost benefits and continued contributions. One employee, over half a million dollars. Would you recover from that? Five, my husband is also a state employee. Imagine the combined impact. And this isn't even factoring in the reduction we would experience from the reduced COLA, extended AFC, risk sharing. Would you want that for yourself, for your children? Six, this proposal has already precipitated an unnecessary crisis for our workforce. The governor's proposed budget funded the ADEC to give time to create a plan. Instead, you are doing this during a pandemic when you know state employees are all working more and working remotely, and the state house isn't even open to us to show up to share our strong feelings. You are doing this from the comfort and safety of your homes under the veil of secrecy and darkness while we serve Vermonters. Seven, you are misleading Vermonters when you suggest that the ADEC is not a worthy investment of general fund dollars. The ADEC is the best investment you could make with my tax dollars because every dollar spent, investment returns come back to Vermont that are spent in Vermont by Vermonters. Finally, eight, I have to believe that all of this means you really don't understand or appreciate the magnitude of the impact this will have on the workforce, service quality, quality of life for Vermonters ongoing and about attracting talent to our state. So slow down and first seek to truly understand and give this process the due process it deserves. Thank you. Next up, we have Peter Booth and on deck is Christina Sweet. Welcome, Peter. Hi there, thank you. Um, so I wanted to, I'm a math teacher. I've taught at the Woodside Juvenile Rehabilitation Center in uh, Colchester, I've taught at People's Academy out in Morrisville, and I currently teach at Champlain Valley Union High School here in Hinesburg. Um, and I'm a math teacher and an English teacher. And um, I did some math and I uh, calculated the amount of money not contributed that was recommended, recommended ADEC from 1979 to 2006. And that money totals $172 million that was not put in by the state. That money, with each quantity being individually compounded through to 2021, that adds up to two, uh, to, sorry, to $923 million. So of the unfunded liability, which I believe is 1.9 billion, nearly half of that is directly attributable back to that underfunding. And I understand none of you were involved in that, but I think that it's sort of been mentioned in passing that there was some unfunding in the past. The unfunding for the past is a massive piece of this deficit that we're in, this unfunded liability. Um, my other point was that uh, to, to, this is not, a teachers didn't make this happen. I didn't make this happen. Um, this is a problem that the whole state has and to, to put all of this financial responsibility on a handful of people and say, you guys are gonna have to deal with all this is just inequitable. The, 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 the hit needs to be at, the, at a minimum spread across all Vermonters. This, teachers didn't create this problem and teachers shouldn't be asked to solve this problem. My last comment, I apologize for rushing, 
is that um, I find this whole thing, the, this, this proposal disingenuous. Beth Pierce put together a proposal um, which people said, don't worry, that's just a initial bargaining moment. That was then taken and you added the rule of 90 switch to age 67 retirement, which I believe, which makes it catastrophically worse and then allows you to then be reasonable and back off on that and tell teachers, you've gotten what you asked for. You didn't want to work till you were 67. We've backed off on that. And then everything else that Treasurer Pierce put in position sails through. So I really, I feel the whole thing is disingenuous around we're trying to work with you and we respect your, your hard work. Thank you. I apologize for going a bit long. Thank you, Peter. Um, next up, we have Eric Davis. And then on deck, we have Eric Hutchins. I guess Christina Sweet is not with us. So welcome, Eric. Thank you for being with us. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm sorry, my video, uh, there we go. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm an analyst with the state of Vermont. I'm also a fiduciary of the retirement system. I thank the legislature for your attention to this important issue. I have no doubt it's being approached with the best intentions but the House proposal leaves me gravely concerned that we're headed down the wrong path. We must work together to strengthen the pension system, but the idea that it needs to be saved from the brink of collapse is hyperbole. If we are to solve these issues, we must be forthright in their characterization. The pension system has only been discussed in terms of its challenges. We also need to acknowledge that we are at a point where ADEC payments begin to make significant progress in paying down the unfunded liability that assumption changes have absorbed existing cost pressures and that we sit on hundreds of millions of dollars of unrealized investment gains. The sky is not falling, but prudent action is appropriate. However, these actions must recognize a shared responsibility and be fair and equitable. Those are the principles that must guide us, not dollar figures. The house proposal fails to meet this test. Employees have an obligation towards the normal cost. Recalibration there is fair and equitable. The employer has an obligation to make payments towards the unfunded liability. Yes, costs have increased, but taking away earned and deferred compensation, compensation because a lower ADEC is preferred is a broken promise. A true compromise is one where all stakeholders, including the legislature and the governor, have that shared sacrifice and are a little uncomfortable with the solution. The House proposal puts the burden only on the backs of public servants. We must do better. On a personal note, I chose the state of Vermont to spend my career working in, in the public interest. I value my work more than the salary or benefits, but this was the first week I questioned the value that my employer put on that work and questioned whether it was the right place. Again, we must do better. Thank you, Eric. I have Eric Hutchins now, and then on deck is Ann O'Hearn. Welcome, Eric Hutchins. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Eric Hutchins. I'm a teacher at Lamont Union High School in High Park, Vermont. Uh, I live in Johnson. I'm a graduate of uh, University of Vermont, class of 92, I believe the uh, same year as the chair. Um, so I want to thank you for taking the time to see us. But And I'm going to throw out my notes here because I, it just two minutes is not enough time. I just need to express to you how I feel. I find it unfathomable that this group of people would consider what they call stabilizing the pension fund, not by actually stabilizing it, but by cutting the promise pensions that you made to teachers and state employees, that additional revenue sources were not even considered in the initial proposal is an affront to all working class Vermonters. Uh, many of you in this Zoom campaigned or run for parties that have platforms or issue stances that portend to be for progressive tax structures or supporting working class Vermonters or being champions of the middle class. This plan is regressive. It takes a financial problem that the state has and it puts that burden on a regressive tax on all educators and state employees who will have to pay more out of their pockets and future elderly retired employees who will get less and have to work longer. It is an affront to the sensibilities of what our state is supposed to stand for, of what progressive shared burden politics has to stand for. Um, I urge you to scrap this entire policy, go back to the drawing board 
and pick a plan that shares the responsibility and come up with something akin to uh, Senator Hooker's S-59, which uh, proposes a 3% tax on all Vermonters that made over $500,000. Uh, the Trump tax cuts provided the 5% of wealthiest Vermonters with over $200 million in tax breaks in just the year 2018. The share responsibility belongs in those places. And I urge you to scrap this entire plan, go back to the drawing board and share this burden among all Vermonters, especially those most able to pay. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Eric. Uh, next we have Anne O'Hearn and then after that, Joseph Sabatasso. Welcome, Anne. And Anne, if you can unmute yourself, super. Hi, my name is Anne O'Hearn. Um, this is about this is about my pension, and uh, I've been planning for my career, and um, I've been putting aside money. I've been talking to people. Uh, the Vermont State Teachers Retirement Pension is one third, I think, of the stool that I plan to sit on when I retired. Um, I always expected it would be there when I started teaching. I knew because uh, my parents were teachers, my husband's parents were teachers. I knew that that was part of the deal and that that was going to be there. And, and that is part of what attracted me to working in the school. Um, now I see the proposal, it's really looking like less money for me and working longer, and I'm not for it. Um, I think, as, I think a, a pension is an agreement that you pay because I paid and we entered an agreement about it. Um, it is a promise and to make changes right now, it feels like the rug is being pulled out from underneath me and it feels dishonest and unfair um, and pretty terrible. Um, and even the average retirement amount a teacher gets is around 21,000 at this point, and that's no pot of gold. And um, I, I urge you to take longer, like other people have said, and um, find the money from some other area. 15 seconds. Am I done? Um, and I just want you to know the teachers aren't a menace. You know, we're just people. And I, I want to know that you get that. Thanks. Thank you, Ann. Uh, Joseph Sabatasso and on deck is Tom Clogg. Hello, good evening. Um, oh, video. Um, good evening. I'm Jody Sabatasso. I teach uh, at Rutland High School. Um, I've been teaching for 22 years. Um, and I've been looking forward to the pension in the time. Rule of 90. That puts me retiring at the age of 60. That puts me in the classroom for another seven years if we're just talking about the age base. All these are a problem for the teachers. We're in your community, we're people of your community. When we retire, we volunteer in the community on all kinds of sort of, sort of levels. We give back to your community all the time and you're, you're taking away what we can give back. Um, so I put together a quick little scenario uh, and I just, since it's only two minutes, I just based it on age-based retirement and changing to 67, even though there's an issue with all your proposals. So. Vermont right now has 40, about 40,000 full-time employees. If 5,000 employees retire at the age of 60 versus the age of 67, it will cost the state in taxes $2.1 billion by asking those employees to work an extra seven years over that seven year time. That's $300 million a year. If you, keep the rule of 90 and let us retire at the at the rule of 90 which would be me the age of 60 and you hired 
new teachers, younger employees, and put the starting wage in the starting wage average for a state employee is twenty eight thousand dollars. That means over the next seven years, that's about one billion dollars. That <laughs> means you save the state a billion dollars in time. So if you put four hundred million dollars towards the, the the problem with the state, you save the taxpayer six hundred million dollars. And so I'd like to say that you can't make these changes. You can't do this to us. And nowhere can you break our promise to us that when I started teaching at the age of 26 and making $23,000 a year and negotiating contracts, taking less money over all these years. And I've negotiated five contracts now. And every year we take less money because we know we need to put more money into our state pension or the school boards have to put more money to state pension. And so we take less money because our health insurance costs more and it costs the school district more money. So we take less money over and over. And now you're ripping a rug from underneath us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, Tom Plug, and then on deck is Laura Brown. Hi, good afternoon. I want to say, first of all, I'm a teacher and I am proud to be a teacher. I love teaching. I was formerly an attorney for 20 years in practice and I'm choosing to do this. This panel needs to understand that this feels like a gut punch, a sucker punch to the goodwill of the teachers who raise young Vermonters, who educate young Vermonters and who make our society better. We work for you, but we are not beholden to the government. We are not beholden to the legislature and we demand as a group to be treated fairly. And I'm gonna ask this committee to think about where this leaves teachers and SUs as they negotiate new contracts. Because if the supposition is that we're just gonna sit there as a group and say, oh, okay, we're just gonna take this, that is a, a very, not, not a great way to look at this because you can bet that when we sit at the negotiating table, we're going to be asking the other people who should be sharing in this burden to share in it by increasing our salaries each and every time to help make up some of this. I've heard some sound financial reasons from people um, and I have to agree, There's the world's not on fire here. You're choosing at the worst possible time when teachers have done so much to prop this state up and get people back to work at our own risk to our health, our own potential peril, and you're doing this to us or proposing to do this to us. It's not fair. It's grossly inequitable. Imagine working nine years, nine years into this, and you suddenly become disabled. Well, there goes the roughly thirty to fifty thousand dollars you put into this pension system. Inequitable. If someone asked me three months ago, should I become a teacher? I would have said yes. If somebody asked me now, I would say, I don't know. Can you afford to? Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Um, Laura Brown and then Nora Skolnick. Welcome, Laura. Thank you. Um, thank you for being here. And um, my name is Laura Brown. I teach first grade at Floodbrook School. And I've been teaching for 16 years, starting in Brooklyn after 9-11. Um, and I, I was a member of the AFT. I was also a local one member of um, IA. I was a for I am a former stagehand and I made a lot of money. And um, I chose this career and I came through in the um, teaching fellows program in New York City, which was an amazing program. And that program was created um, because they found that they could not um, staff high needs um, schools and they weren't paying teachers enough money and they weren't um, giving teachers enough benefits and they changed all of that in New York City to make things better for teachers and it worked and they got um, they got second career uh, teachers who were knowledgeable and trained and did a wonderful job yeah and I include myself as, as one of those people 
Um, we as teachers did not create this problem with the pension. It was created by legislators in the 90s who refused to listen to the expert actuaries working for them and decided to underfund our pensions. This was not a choice that I made, nor is it a choice of any of my colleagues who are planning to retire based on the guidelines they were giving upon being hired. The cost of this pension plan was seen in the 90s and our state legislators refused to do the right thing for whatever reasons. Now teachers are being presented with a cruel plan, not an unfair plan. We are the teachers who face the challenges of teaching in a pandemic. Schools closed and it was not principals who made the teaching happen. It was not superintendents. It was not Dan French who made the teaching happen. We, it was teachers and support staff who directly served our students. We learned Google Classroom, Seesaw, new approaches. We gathered as educators on Zoom and helped each other find the most effective ways to reach our children in Vermont, some of whom lacked a lot of basics necessary to thrive in the middle of a pandemic. I ask you, we did it, and now you're presenting us with this. I'd like to say it's an option, but we were not given a choice back in the 90s, and we're not given a choice now. You were or your colleagues were, and now you need to do the right thing and find a better way, a new approach, a new way of thinking outside the box, just like we did last spring. I have faith in your abilities to turn this around. My greatest hope is that you will care as much about our Vermont teachers as we care about our Vermont children. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Uh, now we have Nora Skolnick, and after that is Dave Bellini. Welcome, Nora. Hi, thank you. Um, my name is Nora Skolnick and I am a teacher at Randolph Elementary School. Thank you for allowing me to speak today. To say that the proposal put out by the House is unfair and immoral is an understatement. Teachers have been putting their lives on the line and they, along with state employees, are working harder than ever to help hold their communities together this past year. The statements of gratitude for all that we do holds no value. They are made and then in the next breath we are asked to pay more and lose benefits in a pension system that is already rated one of the worst in the nation. Our thanks is being told to work longer and harder for less money. The legislature has ignored the financial problems and mismanaged our money for nearly 20 years. There are solutions to this that will not penalize those who kept their side of the agreement. Indeed, there are billions of dollars in federal money that can be put into the system and an expected increase in revenues from taxes, all of which can solve the problem without hurting a single teacher's benefit. Instead, it appears as if the legislature is looking for a quick fix on the backs of those who can't afford it. I don't know a single teacher who went into this profession looking to get rich. We know from the beginning that there will be long hours, sleepless nights, and that the rewards are mostly intangible, a grateful smile from a student, the excitement in class during a light bulb moment. One thing we thought we could expect was not having to worry about finances once we retired. This proposal is pulling the rug out from under us and doing it during the most difficult time in our professional careers. I have taught in Vermont for over 25 years. During that time, I have seen my benefits being constantly chipped away. I remember the last time a quote deal was made to solve the financial problems with the pension system on the backs of teachers. The legislature made a commitment to us then and is breaking that commitment now. It is wrong. I implore you to do the right thing and reject this or any other proposal that cuts pension benefits. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nora. Next we have Dave Bellini and on deck is Molly Stoner. Hello. Hi, welcome, Dave. Hi. Uh, well, I've only seen the proposal for uh, a day and a half, and I've got two minutes to analyze it. Um, I will leave out the part about how I feel about it and you, because um, I think you know. Uh, I've been a state employee for 42 years. And uh, first, let me thank the uh, committee members that have spoken in support of state employees and teachers. I think you let, as so I'll get right to it, I think you left out of your proposal, Madam Chair, what's the dedicated revenue source that you really need if you're serious about solving the pension issue? And 
Everyone wants to know when the effective date is. I mean, why would you not tell us? People have already retired based on what the treasurer said and what we've heard you're gonna do. So we need to know that because I speak to a lot of state employees and some people, if, if your proposal goes through and I know you're serious about it or you wouldn't have written it, some people would be better off resigning before the implementation date, which you won't say what it is, because you've said, if, if, if you really mean it, that vested terminations will be held harmless. Well, we need to know because some people are more advantaged by resigning now if the effective date's July 1st. It's, it's based on their age and based on their life circumstances. I mean, did you think this through? So they need an answer now because they need to quit. I will advise them to quit because it's in their best financial land. Give them time to see a financial plan. Uh, and I hope one of the Republicans will call me at home and just talk to me. I need to talk to somebody that's sane. Thank you. Okay, I have Molly Stoner and on deck is Vicki Brown. Welcome, Molly. Thank you. My name is Molly Stoner. I'm a fourth grade teacher in Dummerston and vice president of my local union. I've been an educator in the state since the 1980s. Until Wednesday afternoon, I had planned to retire in six years when my youngest son is projected to graduate college, and that felt almost doable. Your proposal dramatically affects that for me personally. You see, I'll be fully vested in five years and two months. <laughs> that and <clears throat> those la there's no graduated release in your plan. Those last two months that I need will require I teach five years longer to the age of 67. I can't fathom that, and this concern has been voiced by so many in my district. This year of constant change, problem solving, incredibly long hours has left me feeling akin to how I felt after seven weeks of radiation treatment. I've shown my commitment over and over again as a public servant in a pandemic. And while not every year is this hard, it is not a desk job teaching 67. Other voices from my district. Allison is a young teacher who's followed in family footsteps. Requ requiring us to teach until 67 is inhumane. This proposal makes me consider looking elsewhere for a job, certainly not re recommending working as a teacher in Vermont. May, another young teacher, is hoping to make a life here in Vermont, but now says, quote, this will be on my mind as I look to purchase property and I know other young teachers also leaving the state. Tom, a mid-year teacher who lives in Massachusetts, says he is starting to look at jobs there. He calculates that starting over again in Mass right now, he would still work fewer years and have a better retirement package than staying in Vermont. I would be foolish not to, he says. I'm left so concerned for my family, sure, but more importantly for our state, our schools, our children. How will we draw young people into this profession? How will towns afford the teachers so high on the pay scale? And who will want to teach in Vermont? I know your job is robust and challenging, and I feel such gratitude you're willing to do it, much like I feel the gratitude for every single teacher out there. We moved our entire industry to a new platform in two days. Call us to the table. We know how to be creative. Thank you. Thank you, Molly. Uh, next up is Vicki Brown. After that is Marie de Bendetto. Welcome, Vicki. Yeah. Hi, good evening. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you tonight. So I'm Vicki and I currently teach in Colchester School District as a special educator and I live in the town of Milton. And I'm not going to talk to you about facts and figures tonight. I think we can all agree that the reason why we're here tonight is that the pension has been significantly underfunded and it's not educators that haven't contributed their fair share. But I want to tell you a little bit about my story. So I spent the first 13 years of my teaching career working in alternative programs um, associated with mental health agencies. 
I recognized after those 13 years that I really needed to start thinking and planning for my retirement. So as much as I love those students, I did make the switch to public education. I joined Colchester nine years ago, and I am 19 years away from retirement um, under the current plan at age six, and I would be 65 years old. This is an important number 19, because while it seems like a long time, 19 years is not enough for me to come up with a plan to recoup the losses of the proposed changes that you make. I have made decisions for myself and my family based on the pension that was promised. Some of these decisions include how much mortgage I could afford, how much I could contribute to my children's college education. These decisions with the knowledge that I had a pension that was guaranteed have put me in a position at that now that I don't have the flexibility to contribute to a 401k and try to recoup some of these losses. I am a lifelong Vermonter. I was born and raised here. I chose to raise my family here. And I'm very concerned that these proposed changes will make my plan of retiring in Vermont unobtainable. I'm fearful that I'm not going to be able to retire in the state that I work and love. Making Vermont a place where teachers cannot afford to retire not only impacts the state financially, uh, as we would spend our retirement income here, but it impacts the communities as well. Educators are community members. We have decades, if not lifetimes, ties to our communities. We're Little League coaches, Girl Scout leaders. We contribute in so many ways. Changing the pensions that were promised to us partway to our retirement is incredibly unfair. We've done our part. I'm going to ask that you do your part to figure out how to fund and guarantee the pensions that were promised to us. Thank you. Thank you, Vicki. Uh, next up is Marie Di Benedetto, and then Tev Kalman is on deck. Welcome, Marie. Hi, um, my name is Marie. Thank you for listening. I am a first year special educator at CVU. Um, and like Vicki, um, who just spoke, I also spent the last five years um, working at an alternative school uh, with students with severe emotional and behavioral needs. And so um, I didn't have a pension plan there. And part of um, my move public school was to really feel like I had more security. I was told at this point, being 35, that I should be close to having double my income in retirement savings. Um, but because I've, I've chosen to work with some of the most marginalized um, students that need mental health support, I wasn't able to get that head start. So especially a year where my skills to support those students with severe, are, are to bring my um, expertise to support students with social emotional needs um, to just pull our pension uh, security that I thought we had just feels it, it's hard for me to speak right now because I just feel so, so mad. Um, and many, many other teachers my age still have student loans they're paying off. Um, many of my friends who are teachers aren't even close to being able to buy a home. So I just want to highlight that that those, you know, increasing the percentage that we have to pay in and putting it on our backs is completely unacceptable. I also want to highlight that it also really deters highly qualified teachers from getting into the profession. And it's also discriminatory towards uh, single mothers who are teachers. It's discriminatory towards um, people of color who might want to get into teaching and don't have the generational wealth that white Vermont people have. So this isn't uh, it's not just about um, teachers now, it's also about um, it's also about retaining good teachers and diversifying um, what our teachers look like in Vermont to support students. Thank you, Marie. Uh, next up is Tev Kelman and after that, Ray Werner. Welcome, Tev. Thank you. Um, yes, my name is Ted Kelman. I am a high school English and social studies teacher in Randolph, um, where I was born. I'm a uh, graduated from Vermont Public Schools. And after attending college out of state, I chose to come back here to teach because I wanted to invest my life in serving the school system, the communities that had educated me. This proposal and the fact that I have to be here on the eve of Passover to beg for the right to be able to afford to retire makes me wonder whether I made the wrong decision. I really love what I do. I love my students. I love teaching them American history. I love teaching them to write. 
but this past year and especially the past 48 hours have made me feel so disrespected, so dejected, so pessimistic about my chosen career. My colleagues and I have put our bodies on the line to keep the public schools open and running during a global pandemic and a pandemic that has exposed the weaknesses of our public sector and how financially precarious so many of our working families are. We know that there are hundreds of millions of dollars in untaxed wealth accumulating at the top of the income pyramid. We know there are hundreds of millions more pouring into the state and federal dollars. You would think this was a moment to invest in our public sector and our public schools, but this proposal is asking us to work longer, pay more, and live on less in retirement. And I've lost too many colleagues in the first couple years after they retired not to recognize that you are asking people literally to work to death. I reject the premise of this proposal. This is not on us. If you, as you've heard, we paid our fair share. Um, why the state didn't address these discrepancies earlier in the wake of the federal tax cuts in 2017, or really during the entire recovery since the 2008 crash that the chair mentioned, why embrace a plan that's a slap in the face to 20,000 essential workers and that will drive experienced professionals away from our schools and state agencies when we need them most? And those most hurt by the proposal are our youngest employees already crushed by historical levels of college debt. Any sensible college graduate will think twice before pursuing a profession with such low pay, such increasingly questionable safety, uncertain retirement, and such low levels of respect. I know I'm over time, but you can give me five more seconds if you're asking me to work 10 more years. Please seek, this seek to close this funding gap through raising revenue from those who can afford to pay more in taxes, not on our backs. Thank you. Thank you, Tep. Next, we have Ray Werner, and on deck is Charlie Dickerson. Welcome, Ray. Hello. Yeah, my name is Ray Werner. I'm 42. I work for AOT, Agency of Transportation, out of District 4. Um, I'm pretty new to all this, and I'm, I'm not blaming you guys. I know a lot of this happened long before you guys showed up, but... Um, I really feel that, you know, in my department where I work and stuff, it's feast or famine. We, we don't make a lot of money. When I accepted this job a few years ago, we, we counted on the pension. I don't feel it's right to change the rules in the middle of the game. We agreed to something, and I feel it's your guys' responsibility. You've been elected for these challenges to find out how we can fund this. We don't want to pay a dime more. We don't want to see our benefits change. So if we could just figure that out. I have faith that you guys can, can do that and get that accomplished. I do not support taxing the rich uh, 3%. That's something that, uh, you know, why should they pay more either? I believe that we need to find the fat and you guys need to do some trimming. I know the state wastes a lot of money in areas that, that could probably make up a good portion of this, but I mean, you guys are the professionals in your area and I'm sure you can figure it out. And that's really all I have to say. I mean, Please don't do that. Let's, we, we can't afford to pay more and we shouldn't have to pay more. I mean, you, you dance with the person you brought to the dance. And again, like I said, you know, we're in the middle of the game now and we can't change it. And I don't have the amount of time invested that a lot of these, my coworkers do. And, and they're upset and, and we're going to score you on this. And I believe many Vermonters are going to, are going to score you on this single issue alone. And, and that's all. And thank you. And I'm sure you guys will come up with an alternative. Thank you, Ray. Next up is Charlie Dickerson and, and Noah Dexter is on deck. Yes, Welcome. thank you. A uh, little technical glitch there. Five seconds for 10 more years. That's a pretty good trade. Um, two minutes for a Friday night public hearing with one day's notice is extremely disrespectful. Um, for the first time in my life, I'm going to agree with Bob Hooper, take OPEB and throw it in the trash for now. It's noise, it gets in your way, it should not be conflated. The OPEB on the state plan was 1.1 billion, that's with a B, in 2004, this year it's 1.2 billion with a B. So the world isn't gonna end right away. 
Um, that should be handled separately and can be. Requires creativity, some flexibility. With regards to um, uh, uh, Ms. V from Essex and Peter Anthony, I agree with them that you do not have to do everything all at once. You can take the various principles, parse them out, deal with them separately, deal with them with deliberation. The world isn't going to end. Unfunded liability has been around for 40 years that I know of. Uh, the teacher's plan has been between 40 and 60 percent unfunded for at least 40 years that I know of. The world is not going to end tomorrow. Please, please, please take your time. Think back 12 years ago when the treasurer's office came in and discovered that there was an unfunded liability of $81 million. Oh my God, we have to cut benefits, increase contributions, and tag the legislature with extra appropriations. What happened? 12 years later, the unfunded liability has gone from 81 million to 1.1 billion with a B. And so what makes us think today's um, fix is going to work? I suspect it will not. My Thank time you. is up. Take your time, do it right, and quit disrespecting the workforce. Next up, we have Noah Detzer, and on deck is uh, David Olifson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I'm a teacher at Milton High School, and I want to speak about two things, the pension plan and the artificially rushed timeline on this process. Teachers, state workers, and some members of this committee didn't get the specific changes to the pension plans until Wednesday at 1030. You dropped a gut punch pension overhaul in the middle of the work week while we were teaching your children with two days for review. That's absurd. You are actively rejecting many options for doing this right, like further study this summer, the amendment you rejected earlier today, or a revenue path to fund this, to name a few. Whatever you do, you need to stop calling this painful. You don't get to pretend to care about the pain when you're the ones inflicting it. So let's, let's talk about this plan, which never would have seen the light of day in an election year. Speaker Krewinski says she wants all stakeholders to be at the table, but it's hard for us to be seated at the table when you've locked the door. She also calls her plan a compromise. It isn't because we gain nothing and we're not allowed to opt out. It's not a compromise when our futures are being held hostage. But furthermore, teachers have already compromised by taking on high deductibles on our health care costs. We didn't like it, but we took those on because we trusted you. Now, in the middle of a pandemic during the hardest year of teaching that I or any of my colleagues have had, you're demanding even more higher contributions, risk sharing, more years of service, and zero plan to insure us against additional costs. You've given us no reason to trust that you won't cut even more down the road. If you vote for this plan, you're telling me and every teacher I know that if we are able, we should find a new line of work. And even if this plan is in implemented, there will still be problems. It will lead to a dramatic increase in payroll cost. Uh, Speaker Krewinski's plan forces employees to stay on for years rather than retire and be replaced by lower paid new employees. It's bad policy, it's bad politics, and it doesn't make sense. Reject it. This vote is going to be a test of the character of every single one of you. And when it comes time for us to vote in primaries in August 2022, we will remember what you did today and in the coming weeks. There are ways to effectively reform the pension but this plan is garbage. Your choice is clear. I mean, either you support educators and state employees or you don't. Thank you. Thank you, Noah. Uh, David Allison and then Paul Sherrier. Hello, I'm David Allison. I'm a teacher at Mount Mansfield Union High School in Jericho. And everyone's pretty well spoken here. And I think we all know that no one's hopping on this call in support of this proposal. Uh, it's actually pretty insulting for anyone who's a teacher and, and beyond teachers in this state. Um, I'm the kind of person that you want in this state. I came here by choice to go to college. I graduated from St. Mike's. I stuck around, I started small businesses. Um, I decided to go into teaching and now I'm about nine years into my teaching and I have a family and I have two young daughters and we're the exact kind of people that you wanna have here. And what drew us here, what, what made us stay was safety for our family and education system. 
Uh, no one's coming here for our business. No one's coming here for our industry. No one's coming. They're coming here for our environment and our schools. And the people I know that have moved here have done that. And to do this to teachers, to do this to police, to do this to firefighters, to do this to so many people that work in this state is, is quite insulting. And it cuts a leg out from under the, um, the main problem we have in the state, which is getting young families to come here and grow the tax base. Um, there are other ways that we can do this. This is certainly, I understand, a part of a process. But when you start at this point, you're going to catch a firestorm from people who feel scared. I'm a resourceful person, and I am actually frightened. I, and and I'm, we're coming out of a pandemic, and I am deathly afraid of this proposal and what you are suggesting happens to my future retirement and so many other teachers that I know and so many other people that work in the public yeah. sector. We don't deserve this. We deserve leaders who can be more creative and find better solutions to these problems. And we expect you to do as much and to honor the commitments just like we have by staying and teaching your kids. Thank you, David. Uh, next, we have Paul Sherrier and then Tom Benoit is on deck. Welcome, Paul. How you doing? <clears throat> My name is Paul Sherrier. I have been a teacher at Middlebury Union Middle School in Addison Central School District for, since 1997. I chose this profession out of a passion to help children for the lifestyle and for the security it provides. I enjoy being a teacher. I thrive on the energy of my students, and my passion is still there. I love what I do, it shows. I try to bring that energy every day, and according to my customers, I do a decent job. In terms of security, the promise of a pension was very important to me because I knew I was not going to get rich teaching, but that was part of my choice. I accepted that, knowing what I was going to receive in retirement. Working full-time in the summer to make ends meet was part of my plan. To be clear, I am not complaining. I made a choice. It all felt worth it to me at the time. I believed and I trusted in the promise of my pension and that in the end, I'd be taken care of. I've made choices based on what I was promised. But to wake up today, thinking that I'll have to keep up my pace and my energy for 12 more years instead of six and pay more for less money in the end is disheartening to say the least. It is shocking that the legislature has not listened to the many voices of concern about the changes in the pension system. And now I'm being told I will have to work twice as long for benefits that I'm depending on and I've worked so hard to receive. I'm looking into buying years to retire early, but I'm not looking forward to it. It's a forced choice to do, to not do what I love to do as long as I can do it because I simply cannot afford it. I just do not have the time to make up for the losses I would incur under the new proposal. I am a single income household and all of my eggs are in the pension basket. These proposed changes to the pension system are turning my life upside down in the twilight of my career. Over the past year, I've been thanked by many politicians. Some of you even called me a hero. These are hollow words to me now. If you truly want to thank me for my service, show me that you value what I have done and what I do every single day. I have not missed a day of work this year. Please do that by finding an alternative solution to the problem that was not created in any way by teachers and do not make any changes to the proposed, to the, do not make any of the proposed changes to the pension system. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Uh, next, we have Thomas Benoit, and the, after that, on deck is Susan Oliveria. Welcome, Tom. Sorry, I'm having a little technical difficulty. Can you see me? Uh, we can hear you, but we can only see your box with your name in it. Okay, hold on a second. For some reason, it, okay, there we there go. There we go. Welcome. Well, thank you. Uh, hello, my name's Tom Benoit. I'm 50 years old and I've been working for the state of Vermont for almost 22 years. Uh, for the majority of those 22 years, I was a single parent raising two kids, working sometimes two to three jobs. Uh, total. This taught me how to budget, spend wisely, and go strategically without. Um, I do not have the option to put money into a Roth, deferred comp, or other retirement areas. Luckily, I was legally promised a pension based on 30 years of service and an AFC of my three highest years until now. I'm in total shock and disbelief that this is being proposed. 
With only eight years left until retirement, I'd never make up any of the loss of COLA, changes to what I'd receive, or that I'd now have to work until age 67. In trying to understand this, I go back to my single parent budgeting. If I get my power bill and can't pay it, I don't call up the power company and ask them, can you pay my bill? Can you reduce the amount of my bill? Or could the power company work longer to pay my bill? Yeah, that's exactly what your proposal is doing. This proposal is trying to change the pension at the 11th hour and entirely on the back of state employees. Somehow it's okay to ask me to get a second job, increase my contributions, decrease my pension, or make me work longer, all while holding others harmless. No. This legislature needs to raise taxes on those who have been enjoying the breaks, use one-time monies to jumpstart the recovery, and create a dedicated funding mechanism to assure the pension stability. Your proposal has made me lose trust in the citizens' legislature. It's clear it's for the entitled and select chosen only. Your proposal has soured my working relationship with the state of Vermont. I can't help but think what's the and can it get any worse? Your proposal is and will have lasting negative effects on employee morale, retention, and recruitment. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Tom. Next up is Susan Oliveria. After that is Catherine McDonald. Hi, my name is Susan Oliveira. I'm a school counselor living in Ferrisburg, Vermont. When I began my career in Vermont, I had no idea what the automatic teacher retirement deduction on my first pay stub was all about. I had not enrolled in it, chosen it, or even known it existed. It was explained that I had no choice and that this was for my retirement and that the state also contributed toward that distant goal. Each year until recently, I received a written Vermont State Teachers Retirement System brochure and it explained in detail what I was working toward in terms of retirement as well as what the state of Vermont was committing to on my behalf, what it was promising. Since I began, I've already seen health insurance cuts as a, retire, as a retirement benefit. I believe that was in 2010. And those with just one year service more than I had earned got to keep that higher benefit. They had 15 years in while I had 14. It wasn't a small loss, but I loved my job and I kept moving forward. Now I'm at 26 years of service. And anyone who knows me would agree I've had my share of hardships in life. But after all these years, I was just starting to feel like I had rounded some corners and could look forward to retirement while at the top of my professional game. As I had always hoped, not hanging on to a job while falling asleep at my desk, able to pay my bills, my taxes, and garden in the summers and perhaps volunteer locally. Now well into the game for me, that means after 26 years, my government is confessing that you didn't pay, play by your own rules. You borrowed from Peter to pay Paul, you stole from us. And to add insult to injury, you're about to mandate that we pay for your losses. Please clean up your own mess, keep your promises, and do not blame the victims, the hardworking teachers of Vermont by making us pay for mistakes our government made. Finally, I just must add after listening to everyone that I really don't trust that the retirement marker won't be moved on all of us again. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Um, next up, we have Catherine McDonald. And after Catherine, uh, we have Jill Abair in on, on deck. Good afternoon, sorry for the tech difficulty. My name is Kate McDonald. I live in Fletcher. I've been a Vermont educator for 1993. I'm currently a career and technical education special needs coordinator at Center for Technology Essex. Based on the rule of 90, I'm slated to reach full retirement in 2029 after working for 35 years in Vermont's public schools. We are entrusted by the public to provide a high quality educational experience for all children. It is a sacred trust that parents and community members enter into with teachers 
and it is a compact that teachers willingly accept, realizing that while salaries aren't commensurate with the level of education, emotional investment, and daily flexibility that's required to do the job well, the higher purpose of building and maintaining a strong community through public education is a worthwhile and noble pursuit that our daily contribution to the greater good taken collectively can lead to positive change and strengthen communities. The same idealism that called me to serve in education led me to trust my elected officials when they promised that the pension system would be solvent upon my retirement and the retirement of my colleagues. With the plan put forth by this committee, it's clear that my trust was unfounded. That I am, in fact, a Pollyanna for believing that my 25 years and counting commitment to the children of my community was indeed valued by elect my elected officials. Teachers have worked harder this year than we ever have. We paid into the retirement fund as directed without fail. To renege on your commitment is to break a sacred trust with the teachers whom you claim to value. Those same teachers that were deemed essential to Vermont's recovery after COVID, the teachers without whom Vermont's future is bleak. Teachers did not create the pension problem, nor should teachers bear the sole responsibility in the remedy. This plan put forth is a breach of public trust. Plain and simple, a pension is a promise. We have kept our promise to the children of Vermont. I sincerely hope that you will keep your promises to the teachers of Vermont's most precious resource. Thank you. And Representative Colston, hello to your daughter. I was her VYCC crew leader in 1994. <laughs> Very fun, Vermont is a small state. Thank you, Kate. Um, so committee next up, we have Jill Bear, and on deck is Sarah Thompson. Hi there. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Jill Bear, and I'm an educator of Vermont schools. I'm here to tell you I urge you to reconsider your proposal. While I commend you for taking on a seemingly Herculean task, I want to remind you that you may be acting like gods with your decisions. Your constituents are suffering. This is not the contract that was promised. The impacts of these changes will be felt for years to come by not only teachers, state employees, all of our students, and yes, my own family. Currently on my salary alone, my family cannot afford to thrive in our state. I say thrive because we just barely get by on mine and my husband's wages. I have a master's degree, how is this possible? I've often discussed with my husband how amazed I am that in any other profession with a master's degree, my children could have a bright future. I've openly joked to those that I work with, colleagues and students alike, that I would work for free because I love my job. But sadly, each year I continue in this profession, it feels less like a joke and more like a reality. I've held on to the fact that I've been paying into a solid retirement plan for more than 15 years. I still have a long way to go towards retirement, but I'm anxious that when I get there, there won't be anything left. If I have to pay more each month, I will be taking opportunities away from my children, not just their future, but the lives they're currently living. After looking at your proposal, it appears I can expect to have to pay in over $230 a month. This isn't small change. This is more than two weeks worth of groceries, a month's worth of fuel needed to get to my job. What may seem like small percentages to you have huge impacts. I urge you to step down from your clouds and visit a school for a day. You will find overworked educators who give their all because they are passionate for what they do. You will be in awe of the conversations our students are engaged in and will be amazed at the possibilities that are ahead of them. I urge you to review your proposal and make budgetary changes elsewhere. It is the right thing to do. Thank you very much. Thank you for being with us, Jill. I appreciate that. Um, next up, we have Sarah Thompson. And um, coincidentally, after that will be Michelle Thompson.
Welcome, Sarah. Thank you so much. My name is Sarah Thompson. Most of the students who graduated in my high school class that went on to college no longer live in Vermont. Vermont has little to offer in terms of diverse, reasonable paying, stable jobs. Gutting these pensions will push more young profess professionals out of the state. I have been a teacher at Virgin's Union High School for 16 years. I've been paying in and making my life plans based on a pension system that would allow me to retire after my age and years of service equal 90. I've had no choice in paying into this account and now you are changing the rules halfway through my career. None of my non-teacher friends have held the same job in the same location for 16 years. None of my non-teacher friends have a master's degree. All of my friends make more money than I do. But I told myself, it's okay, you have a pension. Teaching is a labor of love. It is exhausting. No one should have to teach for 45 years. After a certain amount of time, you just can't maintain the energy and effort required to work with children. Teachers burn out. Teachers shouldn't feel trapped by their pension requirements to work a decade past their prime. Students deserve better. School districts deserve better. There will be less turnover as more teachers stay in schools to earn their pensions, reducing the available jobs for new, young, enthusiastic teachers. School districts will bear the brunt of paying for these older teachers who will be at the top of the pay scale. I need to share a story from a friend of mine today at school. My friend told me, in August, I was the school's teacher of the year. In October, I was a finalist in the state, and in March, I'm wondering if I'll stay in education. This is a shame. Please find a way to provide teachers with the pension they were promised. The problems in funding started over 30 years ago. You can't expect to solve this problem on the back of teachers overnight. We have held up our end of the deal by supporting, challenging, loving, and educating your students and our own. We did our job. Now please do yours. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, next up is Michelle Thompson. And after that is Andrew Emrick. Good evening. I was listening to a committee meeting from earlier this week and was struck by something that the chair said. Madam Chair, you said that the exemption for those within five years of retirement is not a magic number. You noted that those people are making plans for where they're going to live and what they are going to live on. And it does not make sense to make changes to those people planning their retirement. I may only be 32, but I am planning my retirement. I have been planning my retirement since the day I took my first job out of college. I made strategic and diverse investments early on to set myself up for an early retirement if I wanted to. Five years ago, I left my home state to come work for the state of Vermont because of what the state could offer in terms of lifestyle, job satisfaction, and benefits. I took a pay cut, but having a pension in addition to my other investments was worth that pay cut. I continued to make my retirement plans strategically based on the retirement group I entered into upon hire. I made life and family choices to move and grow my family in Vermont. We are taxpayers. My husband and I bought a home big enough to grow our family in. We have been making improvements to our home with the full intention of establishing and maintaining roots here in Vermont. Our daughter will eventually go to the school that backs up to our backyard. All these life changes required planning along the way, which included factoring in how these life changes would impact our savings and retirement plans. These proposed changes undermine all the reasons I moved to Vermont as a young professional. Myself, along with my fellow state employees and teachers, all have made our retirement plans. We made these plans on our date of hire. Anything less than what we were promised is unacceptable. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Next up is Andrew Emmerich and on deck is Sylvan Ross. Uh, thank you all for being here. I typically use Zoom with five and six year olds and yes, they are experts on this platform. So speaking to grownups tonight, it's a little different. 
My name is Andrew Emrich, and I'm a kindergarten teacher at Thatcher Brook Primary School. I grew up in Vermont, graduated from UVM, and have taught in Vermont communities for the past 10 years. On Wednesday, once I got over the initial shock of the proposed pension changes, I started to think about how this is going to impact me and my fellow teachers. I'm currently paying 6% into the retirement system. With these proposed changes, that would mean over the next 35 years, I would see about $40,000 less in take-home pay. If I'm able to keep the additional one and a quarter percent myself and invest it, even with a modest return of 6%, that $40,000 turns into $120,000 and compound interest is a wonderful thing. I get into teaching to make a difference in my students' lives. I love seeing the light bulb go off in my students' heads when they're learning, but that will not help to pay my utility bills in retirement. I accepted that teaching would not make me rich, but that acceptance was with the understanding that I would have great health benefits and can rely on my pension to help me live a modest lifestyle in retirement. Both of these systems are now under attack. This proposal would have me working an additional 10 years, trying to think about getting off from my classroom carpet after sitting crisscross applesauce at age 57, let alone 67, makes my knees and back hurt now. Forcing teachers that are at the top of the pay scale to teach longer is going to hurt taxpayers in the long run. This proposal will help fix the pension issues, but only because there won't be anyone left that wants to teach. My first thought upon seeing this proposal is that I ought to find a new profession or leave the state like many other young Vermonters. If anyone were to ask me if I think they should pursue a career in education, my answer would be a resounding no, run in the opposite direction. This is not the first time the promise made to teachers about our pension is being broken and it likely won't be the last. I teach my kindergarten students that people won't wanna play with you when you don't follow the rules and play fair. Changing the rules halfway through a game isn't fair, yet that's what's happening. The pension system has major problems, but teachers should not be the ones responsible for fixing something we didn't break. Implementing a tax on the highest earners in the state, using more federal funds, and responsible investing with lower admin fees are ways to solve the problem. Continuing to insult educators by making them pay more, get less, and work longer is wrong. Teachers believe education brings value to society, but it's so sad that society sees no value in teachers. I wish I had more than two minutes to talk to you all about something that will impact me and others for the rest of our lives. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, next up is Sylvan Ross, and after that is Robin Bebo Long. Thank you. My name is Sylvan Ross and I'm a resident of Richmond and a third year teacher who has worked at Jericho Elementary School since graduating from Champlain College in 2018. I would like to be preparing my home for Passover, but I feel like I need my voice to be heard, so I am here. I am exactly what Vermont is trying to attract and retain, a young professional who hopes to work, raise a family, and live here. Since I came to college seven years ago, I have had every intention of staying and teaching in Vermont until retirement. I represent the future of Vermont teachers and Vermont's teachers and families. However, under the new proposal, it's just not worth it. I started teaching at age 21 after graduating college early. You are now asking me in order to fully collect on my benefits to teach until I am 67. That means I, a kindergarten teacher, will have to work, will have to teach for 47 years before I can retire. That is a significant increase in years that I have to teach in order to collect less benefits than I was promised, all while contributing more. I am young and I can go teach somewhere else for a different pension, a better pension. The last year of teaching has been incredibly difficult. I have felt disrespected, depleted, and taken advantage of again and again. If you decide to continue with the proposed plan, teaching in Vermont is even more unsustainable. I love my job, but I am not a martyr. Young, talented teachers like myself should receive the compensation we deserve for the crucial, highly talented work we do. You are asking us to pay for a shortfall that the state has made year after year. If you, move like, if you move forward with this new plan, I, like many other young teachers, will leave the state or find a different job. Highly qualified teachers provide quality education, which is key to economic growth, fighting our state's population decline, and building a successful democracy. By disrespecting teachers, we are pushing professionals out of schools and leaving significant negative impacts on our children. This plan is telling us that, and teachers and state employees that they are not valued and unimportant. You need to do better. Thank you. Thank you for joining us tonight, Sylvan. Um, next I have on my list, Robin Bebo Long and on deck is Jennifer Zoller.
Hello, my name is Robin B. Belong, and currently I teach for the Two Rivers Supervisor Union, and I live in Rochester. I came to express the perspective of myself and some colleagues on this proposal and our relationships with the communities we serve. I could talk about how this proposal will discourage people from entering what I consider to be an honorable profession. I could wonder if you thought that making teachers teach until they were 67 was a remedy for a teaching shortage. I could talk about promises made to public servants that are routinely broken. After all, our healthcare benefits were greatly reduced recently. There are so many thoughts and paths I can go down in response to your proposal. And thankfully, many of the speakers before have done that. But what I want to make clear is that this is another burden that is being passed on to the towns. Another pull in the threads that binds our communities. A thread that includes many years of telling towns to level fund their budgets. A thread that includes dismantling small schools in the name of efficiency. Now you're including the cost of this proposal. Now their highest paid teachers will have no choice but to stay. Now they'll be stuck covering the cost of much older teachers who are more likely to develop health conditions that may result in extended periods of sick leave. Now a state that already has one of the oldest teaching workforces in the country will lose the innovation and fresh ideas that come with younger teachers. You've heard them. And the strengths that come with cross-generational partnerships. Now you've empowered that guy. You know, we all have him in our town meeting that yells and complains about teacher salaries. Beth Pierce says that the changes would be painful. It doesn't seem like the state is taking much responsibility for that pain, particularly when you consider the money that just came in. The pain for teachers is to pay more, work longer, and get less. The pain for towns is higher budgets. How much more can towns and teachers take before they unravel? Be creative. Find another source to fund and fix this mess. Thank you for coming tonight, Robin. Next, we have Jennifer Zoller, and after that is Patrick Lean. Hi, I'm Jennifer Zoller. Um, I work for the health department. And in addition to my normal job, I've also been working on COVID-19 contact tracing team since the very beginning of the pandemic. I have worked overtime every week for over a year now. That's evenings, weekends, every single holiday. It is so disrespectful to me, my colleagues and teachers across the state that you are choosing now to gut our pensions while we have kept this state running. I also grew up right here in Vermont and I chose a state school for both undergraduate and graduate education, uh, as did my husband who is a state engineer. We both chose to work for the state because we believe in public service, helping our neighbors, supporting our community. We work for salaries well below industry standard for our fields with the understanding that though we'll make less during our careers, we'll be able to retire with dignity. That's the agreement we made with the state. We've been holding up our end of this agreement. The state should hold up theirs. The cuts being proposed would be devastating for my family. We would be taking home even less than we already do, working a full decade longer than expected and receive less than we have financially planned for at retirement. Where is the dignity in this plan? To those who have voiced support for us, I thank you. And those of you who put this proposal together, those that think state workers and teachers should shoulder this burden that we did not create, you should be ashamed of yourselves. How do you thank the health department for our tireless work through COVID and then rip away our pensions in the same breath? It's disrespectful. Remember that it's the people that do the work. People teach your kids. People put vaccinations in your arms. You may think voters have short memories that doing this now far from an election will shield you. I'm here to say that I will remember. Thousands of state workers and teachers will remember, and I will make damn sure that thousands more of your constituents remember as well. Thank you. Thank you, Jen, for being here tonight. Next up, I have Patrick Lean, and after that on deck will be Joanne Smith.
Uh, good afternoon. My name is Patrick Lean, and my wife, Samantha Mishka, and I are teachers at Spalding High School in Barrie. We have long planned to live and teach in Vermont for the entirety of our working lives. As young educators, we love it here. I grew up in Montpelier, my wife in Rochester, and we've always wanted to stick around in order to teach the next generation of students, contribute money to the economy, and participate in the community of this little state that we call home. However, the news of the recent pension proposal on Wednesday could not have been more disheartening. We are suddenly second guessing our long held goals and dreams. Like many other educators in the state, we feel cheated and betrayed by what is being put forth. Cheated because we have held up our end of the bargain by paying into this system and betrayed because we will now be made to shoulder even more than we did before. I come here out of anger, out of worry, out of sadness and desperation. This proposal means Samantha and I will either need to abandon the state we have always call, called home or the careers that we have built since 2012. This proposal means our daughter of three months may not be able to grow up in the state that we have forever loved. This proposal means we now need to rethink our entire future. And that is just us. The impacts of this proposal will ripple throughout communities in Vermont for years to come. Older teachers will be forced to work longer. Younger teachers will stop coming here. Students and parents will see a drop in education and lose out on dedicated professionals who want to be here. 15 seconds. Do not rush this proposal through the legislative process. Please listen to us, the middle-class hardworking teachers who you say you support and appreciate. Please rework and make revisions that will allow people like my wife and I to maintain our careers, our happiness, and our lives in this state. Thank you for your time. Thank you for being here tonight, Patrick. Next up, we have Joanne Smith and on deck is uh, Mandy Alarcon. Great. Welcome. Hello. Good, good evening, everyone. Thank you for giving me the time. Um, I believe this proposal, as most of us who have spoken here tonight, um, amounts to a fundamental bet betrayal of trust and demonstrates how very little regard you have for teachers and state workers and our commitment to this state and our children. I believe you can do better, much better for me and for all of the state workers and Vermont teachers. I currently teach first grade at Thatcher Brook Primary School in Waterbury, Vermont. This is my 15th year at Thatcher Brook and my 25th year of teaching in Vermont. I hold national board certification in early childhood language arts and a master's degree in elementary education. I have served on several leadership committees for the Harwood Unified Union School District and have mentored a dozen or more pre-service and beginning teachers for local colleges, universities, and my district. I have pursued these opportunities and served my district and my state because I am committed to doing my part for our children, your children, who deserve the very best start to their educational journey. I have been steadfast and supremely dedicated, working long hours on the weekends and through many summer days. I have traveled out of state to receive trainings. I have spent my own money on books and resources for my classroom. I have supported my colleagues and have tried to be the very best role model for my students and their families. Although it may seem that I am exceptional in my dedication and service to Vermont's children, I assure you that I am just one of hundreds, many of whom you've heard tonight, if not thousands of teachers who care as deeply and, as are, and are as passionately dedicated to their students and their schools. After a very long year filled with some of the most grueling work I've ever had to do as a Vermont educator, I am completely shocked that this proposal is being offered. It is truly an outrage and a betrayal of trust at the highest level. Over the course of my career, I have made financial decisions based on promises made to me by the Vermont State Teachers Retirement System. And now when I'm nearing the end of my beloved career, your proposal would have me working longer, paying more into the system and receiving less compensation. 
At this point in my life, I can't go back and undo the hundreds of financial decisions that my husband and I have made for our family over the course of almost three decades of service. I shouldn't have to. Vermont teachers should not bear the burden of fixing a system we did not break. You must do better. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Joanne. Next up is Mandy Alarcon, and after that is Bob Morgan on deck. Thank you so much. Um, thanks for meeting with us here tonight. Um, I had a great, great, great speech prepared. And as I'm listening here tonight, I'm realizing um, that I'm instead gonna look right at each of you and ask that you know that I am one person of many that are sitting in front of you tonight um, and who are in this situation. I teach fully remote this year, so I'm well aware how easy it is to kind of uh, zone out and you know not pay attention as I drone on and on. Um, so instead, I'm just going to sit here and talk with you tonight. Um, but no, actually, it's been a fabulous year. I've had really great students and we've had a good year together. Really, what I want to talk about um, today is, you know, for you to imagine that you were in our position, that you're suddenly told that your pay now and in the future is going to be cut because of the negligence of others and how that would feel. How would that affect your family? Okay. Um, it really feels like there have been bad bets made against my future, my children's future, with my money, essentially. Um, and so what I really want you to, to think about here is if you were the ones in this circumstance that your pay is suddenly being cut, even though you've held up your end of the bargain, do you actually think that you or any of your colleagues would suggest this plan that's been put forward? Do you think that you would propose that you or your colleagues are in any way responsible for fixing this problem that you didn't cause? No, you wouldn't. In fact, that thought wouldn't even cross your mind. None of you would even entertain discussing this further. It wouldn't even be a starting place or a proposal used to compromise because you would know it is absurd. It's so insulting. And it's a common thread that as I've listened tonight, this is a common thread I'm hearing from people. Okay, so I'm hope you're, I hope you're hearing that and you're paying attention to that. Um, and my hope going forward is that you'll think about that and that you'll support those of us that have been diligently supporting our youngest Vermonters and that you move forward in your thinking and in your future proposals and in your voting accordingly. Thanks so much for listening tonight. Thanks for being with us, Mandy. Um, next, we'll call up Bob Morgan. Um, and after that is Thomas Payer. Um, first, I want to thank the committee for having this hearing and taking the time to um, listen to everyone and also thank the committee for their work in tackling what is a very, very difficult issue, for sure. My name is Bob Morgan. I'm CEO of North Country Federal Credit Union. I serve on the Vermont Business Roundtable Pension Reform Committee. And um, as I believe many of you know, the status quo with the current pension system is not viable or sustainable. It reminds me of um, products that were created and caused the financial crisis, including negative amortization mortgages, where you pay into something only to see the balance rise, and it leads to a very disastrous end. Um, not making changes now will, will, at some point, most likely in the near future, lead to a negative drop in our bond ratings, and that will increase the amount of money that we have to use every single year to cover pensions and other state obligations and take money away from the services that Vermonters need now and in the future. Um, this is an urgent problem. Fiscal responsibility is um, really needed at this point. The proposal put forward by um, Treasurer Pierce um, will create a path 
towards sustainability for the system. And that will in the end benefit everybody. And lastly, the, this issue isn't something um, that was created today. People kicked down the can for the road for many, many years, and it's really fallen into your lap to be able to resolve. And again, I commend you for having the courage to know it's a tough issue. It requires clear leadership and action on your point, part at this point. Thank you for having me today. Thank you, Bob. Next you. up is Thomas Payer. And uh, last on deck is Amy K. Hoffer. Hello, and thank you for having me here today and all of us. Um, my name is Thomas Payer. I'm a high school math teacher at Winooski High School. Um, my wife is an English language arts teacher at Virginia Middle School. Um, we live here in Starksboro, Vermont. Um, I was named the 2019 Vermont State Teacher of the Year. And with that comes a sense of identity, a sense of purpose and need to promote teaching within the state uh, that I take very personal. Um, to hear what came out on Wednesday is a proposal that doesn't even begin to compromise or really look at what is possible, but rather wholesale takes on the treasurer's proposal um, is just, it, it makes me wonder what is teaching in Vermont, and that's really terrible. Uh, I wonder who I am and who my, my colleagues are in this state and, and how we're viewed. Um, I mean, I just can't say it enough. I am so sick and exhausted of being pitted against my community over and over again for situations that we have no control over whatsoever, between healthcare, um, between these pension costs. This is, this is not our fault. I want to serve my community and I want to be strong in that. But I continually have to define who I am and and reach out to people in ways that, that are just not supportive of the teaching profession. Um, I grew up in poverty. Teaching was the ticket to a stable life. And and I just don't see that anymore. And it's really frustrating and and it's it's sickening to me to consider that that I may have to give this up at some point. Thank you very much. Thank you for being with us, Thomas. Um, because of cancellations um, and folks who didn't uh, weren't able to get on the meeting tonight uh, for whatever reason, uh, Amy Kayhofer is our last um, witness on the list. So welcome, Amy, and um, thank you for sharing your thoughts with us. Welcome. Oh, we're not hearing you. Hold on. Let's see if we can figure that out. Where did you go? If we see Amy appear back in the attendees list, let's make sure that we get her in to testify, we'll give that a moment. She may have just gotten disconnected. All right. Oh yes, we can see you and hear you. I had to relaunch the whole thing, but it was fine. <laughs> My name is Amy Kay Hopper and I am an elementary school teacher at Thatcher Brook Primary School in Waterbury. I have been a teacher at Thatcher Brook for 21 years. My first year teaching salary was $27,550.
Obviously, I did not go into teaching for the money. I became a teacher because I wanted to make a difference in the lives of children in our community. As I began my career path and signed that first contract, I remember thinking, is this the right career choice for me financially? Can I pay my mortgage, bills, raise my two children, afford a different, decent lifestyle? My answer was no, not on $27,550, but my future as a teacher could. And this future included incremental salary increases, thank goodness, and the Vermont State Teachers Retirement System, of which I would begin to access at the age of 62. This retirement plan, which our state government created, has provided me with a personal statement every year outlining my financial future. This plan means everything to me. It's my financial stability. My teaching salary has not afforded me the luxury of setting aside much money for private investments as the financial burden of raising a family, two kids in college, take up most of my paycheck. I chose this career path knowing I could retire after 30 years of service with a pension. Now, almost 22 years later, eight years before I retire, you are proposing to take this away. You are saying to me that I have to teach elementary age students until I am 67 years old in order to receive the benefits of a system that were promised to me at 62. In addition, you are proposing that I pay more into this system only to get less out of it. The increase of 6.25 to 7% and then basing my final compensation on my last seven years of teaching feels like a slap in the face. Our elected officials must find another way. Teachers did not create this problem. We should not have to shoulder this bur burden nor make the sacrifice in order for this to be fixed. Surely there are other alternative solutions. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Um, uh, I understand that Molly Stoner has some remarks that some of her colleagues sent along with her. And since we have a few more minutes, um, and Molly, if you have remarks in writing that you'd like to share with us, I'd like to invite you back in to, to share them. Welcome and thank you for, for sticking with the, the long hearing um, and also for bringing some uh, thoughts from some of your colleagues. If you just remind us again, where you teach. Oh, we, we need you to unmute, there we go. Sure, I teach down in Dummerston and um, I've collected some quotes from people in the whole Wyndham Southeast Supervisory Union. So I'm just finding them here. Um, Rotina is a high school educator. She says the changes in the pension plan impact my level of fear and anxiety for my financial future. As a result, I'm currently considering early retirement and discussing this option with my financial planner. As educators working through a pandemic, we've been forced to go above and beyond with no additional stipend or comp time. Please don't take away what we have worked so hard for and deserve. And pardon me, I have to scroll up an email chain through each of these. Um, I, I summarized that one in mine. Um, one just says, I would consider teaching in another state now. Um, as a new teacher, it's very disheartening to read about the pension changes in Vermont. I was hoping to make a life here, but I'm seriously considering moving to another state that has better retirement benefits for teachers. This will be on my mind as I look to purchase property, and I think the state would want to be attracting young professionals, not pushing them out. I know other young teachers who are leaving for the same reason. That was from May. Um, uh, I think if we're going to be treated this poorly, this disrespectfully, our livelihoods and futures treated this cavalierly, it's time to protest. And that is from Melissa. Uh, sorry, some of this is me replying, so I'm trying to get past those. <laughs> and uh, 
this news is very disheartening, especially since I'm currently going through some major health issues at the moment. I've been paying into Vermont State Pension for 22 years and was planning to retire in 12 years at the age of 58. Given the new rules, I'll have to work for another 21 years before I can retire. And given my current health issues, I'm not sure I'll be alive in 21 years or what my state of health will be at that time. I was hoping to be able to enjoy some of my retirement in relative good health, but with this change of retirement date, I don't know if this will be a possibility. And that was from Joanna. Um, and one, here's, oh, here's another one from Michelle. I've been a teacher in Vermont since I graduated from Castleton State College in 2009. I've been proud of the schools I worked in and the students I've worked with and felt like I had found a permanent home. I've been fully vested for several years in a retirement system that I thought was a gift because many people did not get such a perk from their jobs. Teaching is thankless and tiring and the small benefits we get, decent health insurance, retirement packages, are slowly being taken from us. If we question these choices, we are told we don't care about the students enough. I've never considered leaving the state of Vermont's teaching system until I heard now, until I heard how poorly the retirement system was being managed. Adding approximately 10 more years onto my required service as a teacher who started at 23, we are being hurt the most by this change. This comes just a few years after our health insurance was gutted and we are all handed $5,000 deductibles. I'm finding it harder to justify the job as benefits are slowly being removed and expectations such as working 15 plus hours a day during a pandemic are only increasing. The state of Vermont should be less concerned with bringing in new teachers and more concerned when vested teachers decide to leave the state and take our retirement savings with us. Investing it myself would prove better than leaving it in the state's hands. The system is in a deficit now that will only be worse if vested teachers take their money and leave for another state. I believe I got one more today or yesterday. It, the time all blends together, doesn't it? That's yeah, COVID time. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, that, I think, was just discussion of the particulars. Sorry, I wasn't necessarily prepared to do this part. <laughs> oh, I appreciate it, given that we had uh, 17 or 18 people cancel for tonight. It's nice Excellent. to be able to fit a few extras in. Oh, good. Actually, there, here's another one. Um, thank you, Molly, for speaking up on this for us this afternoon. I don't know about you, but I'm depending on that money as a ASAP in order to start the next chapter of my life. After this year, the demands are so immense that I question when, whether I can even make it to 65 from 59 to retire. I know 67 is too much. I love my students, but the job leaves me not much left for my personal life. I've been watching all this pension conversation the last few months, wondering if I should even try to buy a house. It just seems like teachers are not respected by our legislature. There's got to be other things they can cut to support us. At 59, I have to go the long haul. It's not like I'm a 35-year-old teacher who can change careers at this point. They'll probably drive me out before 65. She goes on about some other things. I don't know about you, Molly, but I'm exhausted this year. For what it takes out of us, it's so hard. It's hard to have anything left for a personal life. Even on a good year, it's hard to travel and see my family on the coast. Um, and she, she just goes on to talk about the challenges of the COVID year, which you all know, and I'm sure experience yourselves. So thank you for listening to those other voices from Southern Wyndham County, um, teachers on the border of two other states. So I think it's a precarious place to be. Uh, thanks so much. Appreciate your time tonight for listening to all of us. Thank you, Molly, um, for, for collecting extra perspectives from some of your colleagues. Um, and I want to thank all of the participants tonight and the folks who are watching along on the YouTube stream. Um, it means a lot for us to be able to take this time and listen to our neighbors. And um, I very much appreciate that uh, on top of all of the hard work that you're doing in the in the daytime that you are willing to come out and and engage in this in the evening. Um, we have another uh, we have another public hearing scheduled for Monday. 
um, in order to accommodate the large number of people who signed up for that public hearing. We've extended it by a half an hour, so it'll be two and a half hour public hearing. I'll probably committee members give you a five minute bio break in the middle because <laughs> that's a long time to be glued to your chair. Um, uh, but I also want to let folks know who maybe are watching tonight and signed up to, to do Monday night is we're going to go ahead and send invitations to everyone who's registered so far, um, because we found ourselves with so many cancellations tonight that we're actually finishing a little bit early. So we're going to add more people than we think we can get to on Monday. Um, and I want to apologize in advance if we add you to the meeting, but we don't get to you in two and a half hours. And again, reiterate that anybody who wasn't able to sign up or, uh, or maybe already testified, but would like to send us their thoughts can do so in writing. Um, and the, the email address is on our committee page where, uh, where our agenda is. Um, Mike Merwicki. Uh, that's just what I was going to share, Sarah, that if people feel like they have more than they could say in, in the two minutes, uh, or if there are people who couldn't make it tonight, or, um, we, we can take written testimony and we'll make sure that gets to all the committee members. Yeah. I especially want to thank Molly for taking the time and for the work she's been doing uh, as a fourth grade teacher. All right. Thank you all. Um, that is the end of our witness list for tonight and um and i look forward to talking with uh, more folks on the weekend in person here in my home community and on monday during our public